the uh, intent behind this presentation is to get you all to think, not just during this hour, hour and a half, but to get you to think in the days ahead about wisdom specifically. The emphasis is going to be on wisdom. And why is that? Well, uh, we belong to the Theosophical Society, and many of you know that the word theosophy comes from two Greek words, theos and what's the second one? Sophia. Sophia meaning wisdom. Uh, the Theosophical teachings, that body of knowledge has also been referred to as the wisdom tradition, right? You've heard that or the ageless wisdom, or the ancient wisdom. So if you belong to an organization with that kind of a name, where the derivation of the word theosophy has to do with wisdom, uh, I think it's a good uh, thing once in a while to just pause and reflect on what is wisdom and what is knowledge. Now you could do a, a very easy, I mean, not, it would be very easy to put together a long talk on knowledge because knowledge has been classified into different types, different categories. Probably would be a very boring talk too. And uh, for me, the cardinal sin is I don't want to bore people. But we are going to compare those two. Hopefully you will think about it because uh, it's really not that, at least my opinion, it's not that easy to tell the difference. Sometimes there's a fine line between knowledge and wisdom. It's not that easy. And to further complicate matters, people, uh, when they're speaking and using words loosely, sometimes they use those words interchangeably. I've probably done that myself. And a couple of expressions, uh, even abuse, make abuse the word wisdom. For instance, you may have, if you were remember when you were a little kid, maybe you were getting into mischief and your dad or your mom said, wise up, David. What they really mean is get smart, use common sense. When they say wise up, that has nothing to do with wisdom. It just means to use your head. So wisdom is very uh, difficult to define. It's kind of elusive. I'm going to share with you, by the way, tonight, some uh, hopefully compelling quotes from different people not just from theoso theosophical literature or theosophical sources, but from all kinds of people, philosophers and whatnot, poets, to show that thoughtful people from all walks of life have thought about it and they have some interesting insights. But knowledge, just to start off with that, it's commonly defined as facts, ideas that we gain or acquire through what? Through study, through observation, or just through life, you know, life's experiences, we gain knowledge. Um, knowledge can also be another way of looking at knowledge. It's an acquaintance or understanding of an art, a discipline like the art of um, knowledge of the Greek language or knowledge of uh, how to play guitar, that type of a thing. And depending on who you're talking to, if you Google the word knowledge, by the way, you can find that it's different people have divided knowledge into categories of four, five, six, or even up to 12 different categories. Uh, we're not gonna get into all that tonight. Um, another fact that we can, I think we can agree upon in that we live in a highly technological age. Uh, there's no shortage of knowledge today, whether it's scientific knowledge, medical, uh, nutritional, you know, you name it. But here's a, let's just start off with some questions. Maybe these are just rhetorical, but if somebody has, uh, maybe you could respond if you care to. Um, let's say that there's a lot of knowledge that's available to the average person today that wasn't available, I don't know, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. Are people happier today than they were in olden times? Of course, I'm referring to before we were born. The only way you would know anything about how people were is if you studied history or read biographies 
So are, do you think people are happier today than they were in, I don't know, Benjamin Franklin's time or Julius Caesar's time? And also another question is, does more knowledge, does knowledge in and of itself guarantee happiness? Knowledge is very useful. Um, it's a necessity, you know, we need knowledge for a lot of things, um, but does it guarantee happiness? Could you be a person that has an encyclopedic mind, but yet live a very unhappy, frustrated life? I think the answer is yes. So there's no shortage to sum up that little uh, thought. There's no shortage today of knowledge. It's out there, it's available, but can we say the same about wisdom? So let me now go back to the PowerPoint. Um, the next screen that I go after the heading will be a quote from one of the great poets of the 20th century, T.S. Eliot. So let me uh, bring the screen back. And let me move to the next. This is from T.S. Eliot's poem. It's a longer poem, The Rock. This is just one, one short excerpt. And this was written, I believe, in, gosh, I, I should have looked up the date, I think in the early part of the 20th century, in the 1920s or 30s. And he asks, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Also, he asks, where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Yeah, he wrote that in 1934. That's what I thought. So I think these questions are worth asking today. You know, 90 some years, almost 100 years later, where's the wisdom that we've lost in knowledge? Where's the knowledge we have lost in information? So if you look at this closely and think about it, T.S. Eliot recognized that mere information does not necessarily translate into knowledge. Secondly, knowledge in and of itself does not necessarily translate into wisdom. And furthermore, this, these two lines of the poem, I think I see a functional relationship here. It's kind of implied. And that functional relationship is that knowledge makes use of information. Knowledge incorporates information. And wisdom makes use of both knowledge and information. So the poem also alludes to the principle of proportion, proportionality. Uh, I say allude because it doesn't explicitly say that, but it, it's kind of between the lines. If you read between the lines, this question is bound to arise. And here is the question. Actually, there's two questions. Um, does too much emphasis on information prevent us from attaining greater knowledge? And secondly, does too much information on knowledge stand as an obstacle to attaining wisdom? So I mentioned that, or I, I said there seems to be kind of a, a functional relationship. And it, I would even go so far as to say there's a hierarchical uh, relationship between information, knowledge, and wisdom, uh, which is not to say that any, I'm not putting down or denigrating any one of those categories. You need all of them. Uh, but that relationship, rather than me spell it out for you verbally, let's, uh, let's go to another quote from, this one is from the voice, of, I believe, the voice of the silence. Let me just... Uh, Yes. Okay, well, this is not actually a quote. Um, 
These are the three halls mentioned early on in fragment one of the Voice of Silence, the Hall of Ignorance, Learning, and Wisdom. Now, if you have not read the Voice of the Silence and somebody just gave you that, what is that? Is that information or knowledge? It's three names, right? So basically it's information. It only becomes knowledge when you understand what each of those means, what it implies, and how it might affect, relate to your life or the life of others. Now there's another uh, famous uh, short piece comes from um, Lovatsky's writings called The Golden Stairs. It starts, some of you have heard it. It's 13 precepts uh, to living the spiritual life, starts off a clean life, an open mind, a pure heart, and it goes through all those. And finally, at the very end, after listing all those steps, it concludes with, these are the golden stairs, up the steps of which the learner, that's you and I, that's you and me, the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom. So at the very end of that golden stairs statement is the temple of divine wisdom. Notice the destination is not the academy of knowledge. The destination is not the bureau of information. No, it's way above that. It's the temple of wisdom, the temple of divine wisdom. So it's kind of implied, even in this short little statement, uh, that there's a great value to be put upon wisdom. So now, um, let's continue. Let's consider what is meant by wisdom. Um, it's often conflated with intellectual brilliance, right? Um, or the ability to make clever statements. And it's a mistake to assume that wisdom arises from an endless accumulation of facts, data, statistics, because you can have all those things at your fingertips and still be lacking in wisdom. This is a, another quote from the English poet of the 18th century. Now, this is a example in poetry called personification where the poet takes an abstract quality and gives it human quality. So here, knowledge and wisdom are given human qualities, feelings. Knowledge is proud that he has learned so much. Wisdom is humble that he knows no more. And is that not true that pride and humility, which are kind of polar opposites, um, is it not true that knowledge can lead to, and not in every case, but it can lead to being proud of oneself, full of oneself, puffed up, thinking one is better than others who don't have that knowledge. But there's universal agreement, and I'll show you some more quotes later, uh, pretty much, a consensus throughout the ages that wisdom is associated with humility, not with pride. And again, this is not to say that knowledge is bad or that we should avoid gaining knowledge. No, you, you need both, but they are different. And also I, I might add that um, there is true humility, right? And then there's uh, the faux humility, where uh, people who have a very low self-esteem, they engage in self-deprecation, uh, you know, running themselves down. That is not humility. No, that's not humility. One can still have a sense of deep self-respect and humility together, but it's not self-denigration. Now, here's another uh, example. This is from one of Plato's dialogues. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with Plato's dialogues. Uh, this one is from the Apology. The Apology is 
the scene where Socrates is taken to court and he's on trial for his life. His great crime supposedly was corrupting the young, the youth. And really all he did was encourage them to question the status quo. But the powers that be, the people that ran the city, the elites of that day did not like that. So he was told to stop, to quit doing that, and he, he wouldn't listen. So eventually it culminated where he was uh, brought to trial. And he gave a speech, he had his chance uh, to speak to a jury of 500. It wasn't like today's jury is 12, 12 men and women. It was like a huge jury, 500 people. So anyway, that whole speech is in the apology, but this particular quote is apropos to the talk tonight. He says, I'm only too conscious that I have no claim to wisdom, great or small. That, that's, that's, um, sounds like a humble statement, right? The guy's on trial for his life. And by the way, that claim that he is something that that's a running theme throughout all the uh, dialogues. He'll meet somebody and he'll, people will come to Athens and they want to talk to Socrates because they've heard he's so wise. And he always, somewhere in the dialogue, he says, well, I don't really know. And then he turns it around and asks the other person. He's very good at asking probing questions, but that gets off a little bit on a tangent. But nevertheless, that's a famous uh, a line uh, that is in that particular dialogue. Now, the voice of the silence, which somebody mentioned earlier, I think Joe or somebody did, um, it's one of my favorite uh, texts. There's quite a few wonderful quotes in there um, relating to wisdom. And here's one of the, one of the more famous ones, I, I would say often quoted ones. Be humble, there you go, humility. Be humble if thou wouldst attain to wisdom. Be humbler still when wisdom thou hast mastered. So the process of becoming, gaining wisdom is, it's a process. Uh, and humility is kind of a requirement to be able to enter that world of wisdom. But when one does become wise, you have to become even more humble, less egocentric, and less conscious of one's uh, individual self. Beautiful quote, very true, one worth meditating on. I'm sure many of you have heard that. Uh, here's another one. Praise, flattery, all that stuff, people telling you how great you are, uh, it leads to self-delusion. And in real life, it also leads to self-destructive patterns of behavior because you have many examples of uh, famous artists, rock stars, movie people who start making a name for themselves and then they're surrounded by these scurrilous agents and uh, handlers and they start telling them how great they are and uh, pretty soon they lose contact with reality and they become unhinged. And before you know it, they're, they're on some big eagle trip. And then, you know, it all ends very badly when you listen too much to that kind of, uh, those kind of words. Now, uh, having said that, warning you of the dark side, if somebody gives you an honest compliment, don't be rude, <laughs> accept it graciously. Don't be rude and say, oh, I don't, you know. No, just say, Thank you very much. I'm glad you, whatever, you know, but don't dwell on it. After you said, thank you very much. Don't replay that tape in your head. Oh, I'm really great. I'm really great. Because pretty soon you'll start to believe your own propaganda. And that's when you lose touch with reality. Somebody gives you a compliment, fine. But don't go seeking it out. If it comes naturally, great. And uh, you should also compliment other people when it's well-deserved that they do something, you know, whether it's your daughter or your son or a, a speaker, a musician, whatever it is, give them a compliment. It's a nice thing to do. Don't dwell on it when it's directed towards you. Say thank you and then let it go because there is a danger of uh, 
the eagle becoming inflated. Now, here's another, this continues, this next one continues on that same, it's a little longer quote, also from the voice. I love this one because it's got great imagery. It's got this picture of a, a tower, you know, maybe supported by four wooden beams and uh, perhaps a bamboo cover on top. And you've got this arrogant person, he's climbed up there. This is an image, you know, self-congratulations. It's like onto a lofty tower up which a haughty fool has climbed. What happens when he gets up there? Thereon he sits in prideful solitude and unperceived by any but himself. So the idea is the person who is self-inflated, they're, they're feeling like they're above it all, like they're up in some tower or they're towering over everybody. But the fact is people don't pay attention to them. Most people, they're, they're not even in their vision or their radar. So again, there are many, uh, not only in the voice, but many of the spiritual guidebooks that we've re read or are reading, you find similar warnings like this, although they're not always as elegantly or poetically expressed as this one. I like this one. So, um, okay, the wisdom tradition, the theosophical tradition. I said earlier, the words knowledge and wisdom, sometimes we use them back and forth interchangeably, you know, synonymously. Um, and you're probably familiar with the term wisdom tradition. I mentioned it earlier, but here, the wisdom tradition is also used as a proxy, meaning a substitute, a proxy for the term knowledge albeit a higher form of knowledge, whether, you know, esoteric, occult knowledge, esoteric knowledge. So according to Blavatsky, the teachings of this tradition are found, and this is a quote from the uh, beginning of the secret doctrine. I think it's either the poem or the introduction. Scattered throughout thousands of volumes of the skill death, embodying, I'll clean that up, embodying the scriptures of the great Asiatic and early European religions, hidden under glyph and symbol. The preface, that's where it's from. So when we say tradition, it really is a tradition because it goes back eons of, in times, not just 100 years, 200 years, this goes back thousands of years. But here's a point I want to make. The teachings per se are not the wisdom. You know, we refer to this, the wisdom tradition. The teachings uh, contain concepts. Some are simple, some are very sophisticated, like in the rounds and chains. Um, and these ideas are, in many cases, about very profound matters. But Merely reading The Secret Doctrine or Jeffrey Barbarca's The Peopling of the Earth or Barbarca's The Divine Plan or Timney's The Science of Yoga, just reading those does not automatically result in the attainment of wisdom. It can lead to wisdom. It can lead to insights. But there's something else that has to take place before you come to wisdom. So, I say that not to uh, diminish the importance of study because Lord knows I, I, read, <laughs> I read a lot. I always have been. I respect study. I think it, study is very important. Uh, esoteric study and all other kinds of study. I love history. I love biography. But don't confuse filling up your, your brain with a lot of interesting, fascinating ideas as being wise. It's, it's two different things. They're related. They're related. Remember that hierarchy, information, knowledge, wisdom, but there's a difference. So now let's get into this a little bit deeper. Wisdom. These are some of the uh, characteristics. In theosophical terminology, it's associated with the uh, principle of uddi. The intellect is the principle of what? Manas, right? Manas 
and buddhi uh, is that higher faculty. It transcends, it operates at a level that transcends information and knowledge. knowledge. Uh, and as opposed to rational thinking and logic, uh, which dissects, and it's very important, uh, you know, if you're a doctor, you need to be able to analyze things, break things down, or a car mechanic trying to figure out why a car is not working, you need to separate uh, the brake system from the fluids, you know, the fuel system and so forth. Wisdom is different, it's integrative. And it's not quantitative, which is another reason I did not define it, it's qualitative, which is, that's a very, uh, you get into kind of nebulous uh, subjective realm there. So, let me just look at my notes. I had another, yeah. So um, wisdom makes use of the power of synthesis, I believe, in my opinion, synthesis, which is uh, bringing different things together. I had the word integrative. And that often uh, demonstrates penetrating insight, which enables us to pierce the dark veils of illusion, and see the light beyond the shadows. I don't mean the shadows out there in the outer world, the shadows within our own mind, the cobwebs, you know. Uh, we have our shadows inside, just ask Carl Jung, right? So a key characteristic of wisdom is that it, this is, a, this is my key point now I'm making. This is the key point that to me, to my way of thinking, it differentiates uh, wisdom from knowledge. The key point is that it profoundly affects how you and I behave in the world. In other words, it's related to doing, it's related to action. Whereas on the other hand, you can read at home in isolation and whatever it is that you have absorbed may or may not have an effect on your life. It may be if you're studying nutrition and you learn about certain vitamins or minerals that you're lacking and then you change your diet. Okay, that has, then that was a wise thing to do. But a lot of times information just stays there and nothing happens to it. So wisdom is very closely related to how one lives their life. And this is not always true, as I said, of knowledge. For example, technical, technical knowledge, whether it's of uh, medical equipment or uh, computers, or electronics um, has very, it can have very little bearing on how we live our life. You can be a, a master carpenter, know all about carpentry, but does it change the fact that you're treating your wife in a bad way and yelling at your kids? If you do that, you know, it's a hypothetical, but so knowledge pertains to a specialized field of study, and that doesn't always seep over into our daily life. And you know, you've heard the cliche, I'm sure, about the marriage counselor, the marriage counselor who is getting divorced, <laughs> or, or the financial advisor who advises people what to do with their investments, and he himself is going bankrupt. So, in terms of right and wrong, people often know what is right. They often know what the right thing to do is, but they don't do it. And a person that we would consider smart or an educated person is still capable of committing foolish acts, even criminal acts. And I work with prisoners. Susan Brown is a mentor, by the way. Thank you, Susan, for your mentor help. I work with hundreds of prisoners, and I dare say thousands over the years, but uh, our prisons are filled with people who are too smart for their own good. Not all of them, some of them are really not too sharp. <laughs> but there's a lot of people there that are too, are too smart for their own good, and um, you know, clever people learned how to uh, do things that were for their own personal benefit, but in so doing, they were violating laws and they knew they were doing it. So, you know, knowledge can be misused, right? But have you ever heard of a person 
a wise person, a genuinely wise person mis misusing it? I don't think so. I've never, I don't recall ever hearing of that. And you can't imagine a wise person committing a criminal act, at least not knowingly or intentionally. So knowledge, okay, we just looked at wisdom. Uh, here's some key points. Knowledge is compartmentalized. I mean, you know, it's knowledge of um, archery, knowledge of a language, this or that. I said it doesn't necessarily affect how we live. It can, and many times it does. And it's quantitative. Quantitative, you can be tested on knowledge. Isn't that what our universities and our school systems periodically you have a test to see if you have absorbed and understand that knowledge? So you can do that with knowledge. Uh, can you pass a test on wisdom? I'd like to see a test on wisdom. I don't, I don't know. I think life is a test. There's the test. Just how you do in life. Um, and you have to live. So going back to T.S. Eliot, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is it? Does that statement apply to you? I don't want you to answer, but when I looked at that, I, I looked back, I paused and I thought, you know, in what way am I maybe guilty of that? Because I, I told you before, I read a lot. I always have love to read for knowledge, for information, for fun, for entertainment. But where's the wisdom? Maybe some of, in other words, maybe I look at it and I say, well, maybe some of the time that I spent hours and hours and hours reading books and doing this and that, Maybe I would have been better uh, sitting back quietly and contemplating, reflecting, meditating, possible. I said uh, wisdom is related to life, and guess who agrees with me? And Shri Ram. He says, when we try to understand the nature of wisdom, by the way, he has a book called Seeking Wisdom, very good book, series of essays. So when we try to understand the nature of wisdom, we will find that we cannot separate it from life. Can't do that. Impossible. You can do that with almost any other. You can learn about dentistry. You can learn about uh, law enforcement. You can learn you know, a chemistry. And it may not have any impact on how you live your life. It may enable you to get a good paying job. It may enable you to be a productive citizen of society, but it doesn't necessarily lead to wisdom. And that's what this talk is all about. Because I think the way our educational system is set up in this, I'd say in the whole Western world, I was gonna say this country, but Europe as well, you know, Australia, the emphasis, is it not, it's on knowledge. And I understand that, I sympathize it, because how can you teach wisdom? You know, it's, you, you can't have a class on wisdom, uh, but you can certainly have classes on knowledge, all kinds of uh, teaching done that way. So going ahead, uh, this is kind of a summary of what we just, the last few slides. Knowledge can be a commodity, partial, fragmented. You know, you might know part of something, but not the whole story. And when I say knowledge can be a commodity, it's because it can be sold. It can be uh, formalized and sold in textbooks, traded, you know, knowledge of investing. You can go buy a book and learn about index funds. You can learn about blue chip stocks. You can, you know, as a commodity. But wisdom is a different animal. It's uh, intangible. It's hard to put into words. It's kind of holistic, I think, is a good way. Um, and it has a unifying, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of unifying process that takes place in the individual, kind of drawing upon all of his or her resources in a moment, deciding what's the, what, what's the best thing to do. So knowledge, you can um, teach it. You can trade it in a form of, you know, trading barter. Uh, you can pass it on from teacher to student, right? From father to son, the father can teach his son uh, carpentry or plumbing. 
Uh, you can pass on knowledge from one generation to the next. Can you do any of that with wisdom? The best the father or mother can hope to do is to set a good example for their child to live wisely. And maybe, hopefully, that child will try to emulate or notice, you know, observe and learn through, through example. But, you know, you can be as wise as the proverbial Solomon in the Old Testament, but you can't transfer your wisdom to me, no matter how wise you are. I might be impressed. It might inspire me, but you can't really hand it over to another person like you can do with knowledge. <laughs> so in one sense, I guess you either have it or you don't, uh, but that's if you don't have it, that's a temporary thing. It can obviously be remedied. Uh, you're familiar with the um, <laughs> New England writer, Henry David Thoreau. This is a very interesting quote, I think. I, I forget where, where it comes from. Wisdom does not inspect, but beholds. Those words are important. The two key words here, inspect and behold. Wisdom, okay, when you inspect something, what part of your mind do you think you're using? You're using your uh, quantitative, maybe qualitative, you're using the analytical part of your brain. You're inspecting, you're looking at details, you're looking at interrelationships. But beholding, it's kind of a poetic term. And maybe this is just my interpretation, but the sense I get, what I think Thoreau was trying to say is the word behold in relation to wisdom is that he's suggesting you see something in its entirety. Behold, it's presented to you maybe in a flash, a momentary insight. Nobody ever gets a momentary insight and says, let me inspect that. <laughs> That's ludicrous, right? Let me let me savor it. Let me let me immerse myself in it. Let me let it seep into my soul. Let me behold it. So there's two different, very different actions. In learning to inspect things is very important. You do it from time to time, but beholding is something very different, I think. So remember, I. Um, I don't have a slide for this, but we talked, I referred to the golden stairs earlier. I showed you how the golden stairs ended. These are the stairs up to which your learner climbs to the temple of divine wisdom. Before the 13 precepts to a spiritual life, before those 13 steps are enunciated, it starts off with this statement. This is golden stairs. Behold the truth before you. Behold the truth before you. So inspecting, you're looking at details, and it kind of relates to this old uh, kind of a cliche uh, where somebody can't see the forest for the trees. They see the small details, but they don't see the big picture. Another little phrase that goes along that, it's hard to see the picture if you're inside the frame. So knowledge very often deals with parts and wisdom very often with the whole or with a bigger picture, a deeper picture. And there's kind of a humorous quote by a Scottish poet. Uh, I won't mention the name because he's kind of obscure, but this quote goes, he's referring to a person using facts and figures. Here's the quote, he uses statistics as a drunken man uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. <laughs> a lot of times people use facts and statistics to bolster their argument. They're not really interested in getting deeper insight or seeing if there's an opposing point of view that might have some credence. They just want to strengthen their point of view and be argumentative. Now, here's another fact. 
a characteristic of wisdom and affinity with nature. And that's why I had that quote by Henry David Thoreau, because, you know, he wrote Walden Pond when he went out there in the, the rural area of Massachusetts and lived out there for a time as a hermit and wrote Walden's Pond. He wanted to be close to nature. Now, the voice of the silence has this quote, help nature, help nature and work on with her. Here, nature is in the feminine. By the way, very often, uh, wisdom is Sophia, that's a feminine. Actually, if I go back to that earlier quote, let me just, uh, I would rewrite it, uh, if I can find that. Yeah, this is that quote by the English poet, knowledge is proud that he has learned so much. I would make wisdom the personification of wisdom feminine. Wisdom is humble that she knows no more, rather than he knows no more. His wisdom is really considered a feminine uh, polarity. It has those polarities to it. Here's a uh, Irish philosopher, a statesman, a writer. Never, no, never did nature say one thing and wisdom say another. Back to Thoreau. Again, I don't know where this was from, but uh, probably could be from one of his letters. He wrote many letters. Anyway, he says, I believe there is a subtle magnetism in nature which, if we unconsciously yield to it, will direct us aright. Uh, as theosophists who have studied the subtle fields, that, that should, we should all be able to relate to that and see much more in that than the average person, perhaps. But, um, you know, energy fields, um, that's, that's something to dwell on, I think. And then we have, uh, so we had the affinity with nature that wisdom has. Then there's the element of time. So it seems to a lot of people, and I agree, that time is, seems to be necessarily uh, involved in attaining wisdom. Um, Here's one quote that backs that up from one of the Patriots, the American Patriots, Thomas Paine. Wisdom is not the purchase of a day. Actually, that's true in two ways. Day, meaning you can't get it in a short period of time, but it's also not something you can purchase. But we'll go, we'll skip over the word purchase. Wisdom is not the purchase of a day. And then you have an older 16th century proverb experience is a father of wisdom kind of saying the same thing but in a different way so these old proverbs that come from centuries ago the reason they still survive is because there's a lot of truth in them people repeat them because they recognize right away that there's there's some truth embodied in that short simple statement so, you know, traditionally, wisdom has been associated with age, just as youth, just as folly has often been associated with youth. And when uh, you may come across a young person who seems very wise, people will say, well, he or she is wise beyond their years. So we kind of expect people as they get older and make it through life uh, and use their intelligence and their brains and um, that they will learn, they will become wiser. And the Native American culture uh, really respected that in many ways. That's one of the really good features of Native American culture that uh, the young people would respect the elders. You have that in uh, Japan another culture where the, the elders are held in great esteem. That has kind of eroded uh, in the Western world. I think that's just my personal observation. But the main point is that wisdom takes time 
Uh, it's not instantaneous, where you can get some knowledge on a certain topic fairly quickly. Now there's a third characteristic, silence. How about that? So, um, you know, whereas knowledge, remember I said earlier that knowledge can lead to uh, pride, you know, an ostentatious showing off of your knowledge, which is kind of uh, not very, it's not a good thing to do. It makes you look arrogant. And, uh, so, whereas knowledge can be outspoken and flamboyant, I'm, I'm personifying these now like the poet did, giving them human qualities. Wisdom is silent, reserved, circumspect. Think of the, the image you have of these Eastern sages, these deep yogis. The images that are portrayed, they don't talk a lot. They're not chatterboxes, right? They're, they're, they're quiet, very intelligent people with deep thoughts. So, Here's another proverb. This is a maxim. Oh, I just said that, yeah. This is an ancient Roman maxim. Wise is the person who talks little. See, these things don't change. This is human nature, whether it's that 16th century proverb or the one by Thomas Paine, or this ancient Roman maxim from 20, 2000, maybe 2,500 years ago. People know that a wise person is careful with their words. They're not a chatterbox. Now, here's a, uh, another quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a Supreme Court justice in the early part of the 20th century. He's doing the kind of same thing that that poet did, Cowper did. He's personifying uh, knowledge and wisdom, giving up human qualities. He says, and this is kind of what you would expect from a judge or a, a lawyer. It is the province of knowledge to speak, and it is the privilege of wisdom to listen. Speaking, listening. When I was a young salesperson, my, my career was in sales. I was told by the person training me, be careful about talking too much when you have a customer. And that is so hard to do, especially when you're a new salesperson, you're nervous, you're not sure of your uh, skills, if you can make a sale, and you get nervous. So to fill in the nervousness, you talk. You talk about your product, whatever it is that you're selling. It's very difficult to be silent. But as you gain experience, you listen that as a salesperson, you want to listen to the customer. I just had a uh, Zoom call with a groups from the Central District this afternoon with Donna, with Barbara, and we were talking about people coming to the Zoom meetings for the first time, or what do you do even when we go back to in-person meetings. And I mentioned that when you have a new person, listen to what they have to say, ask them a few questions, and then be quiet, listen, you'll learn a lot. Don't try to download too much information on that new person or you'll overwhelm them and you may not see them again. <clears throat> oh, this is a good one. This is that English quote again, William Cowper. Knowledge dwells in heads replete. <laughs> I love this. Knowledge dwells in heads replete with the thoughts of others. Wisdom in minds attentive to their own. So again, it sounds like a put down of knowledge, uh, but you can have you can have so so much in your head and not an original thought, which is a pretty sad thing. Um, so, as we know, those of us who meditate and spend quiet, reflective time, it's important to shut down the motor of the mind. This this busy, busy this monkey mind. They call it the monkey mind, right? It's always got to be doing something like a monkey swinging the vines in the zoo or the jungle, our mind wants to go from one thought to another, it just wants to be active. And when it gets tired of one thought, oh, let's go over here. Oh, now let's go over there. You gotta quiet that down and then really, really good things, marvelous things happen. Uh, beautiful things happen, but you gotta silence the mind.
And that's the very first, I think, the very first verse in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Yoga is the silencing of the uh, movement of the mind. I forget the exact term. But anyway, the idea is to quiet the mind down first. So these observations that I have given you, the ancient Roman maxim, uh, the quotes, suggest that there has to be an interior process of reflection. Nobody can do that for us. We have to do that, careful observation of ourselves, of our thoughts, of our actions, and do that frequently. Um, for those of us who live very active lives, busy lives, that's great. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to do that. I have found, I'm just speaking for myself, the best time is early in the morning because once I get going, you know, it's like a, a car revved up going fast and it's hard to slow down in the middle of the day because you got so many things to do. But if you meditate, if you, I encourage you to continue, but uh, if you happen to be noticing you're slacking off and haven't been doing it on a regular basis, try to find a place in your schedule to do that. So, um, Another quality is solitude. This kind of goes hand in hand with silence. But it's a little different. Um, I read a book some time ago. Uh, it's called Solitude, A Return to Self. It was by a psychiatrist named Anthony Storr, Storr S-T-O-R-R. -R. He's not a theosophist. I think the book is out of print because I got it used for five bucks on Amazon. Very interesting book. Anthony Storr says that the capacity to be alone is a valuable therapeutic uh, resource when we have to change our mental attitudes. And he says that the capacity to be alone enables us to get into touch with our deepest feelings. Those of you that meditate know that's true to come to terms with things like loss, loss of a friend, you know, um, suffering, uh, or just our mind has got too many conflicting ideas. It helps us to sort out uh, ideas and reach a state of mental clarity, solitude. So um, point though, solitude is not, and a lot of people mistake it for loneliness, it's not. A lot of people have a hard time being by themselves. They got to be with, they have to have an active, ongoing social life from the minute they get up almost. But, you know, loneliness, it's associated with feelings of being deserted, feelings of desolation, uh, deprivation, being disconnected. Those are typical uh, feelings that people associate with loneliness, whereas solitude, it can lead to contentment. Maybe not right away, but it can lead to that. It can, if you do it often enough, it leads to a sense of self-sufficiency, that I'm not dependent on the outer world for being happy, for being stable, uh, and centered, being centered, being at ease with your own self. A lot of people are not happy in their own skins. You know, you've heard that phrase. A lot of people, they've not, their inside of their head is like a complete um, foreign place to them. They're always living life on the surface. And that's, a, that's one way to live, but I don't think it leads to happiness in the end. I think uh, it could be a fast life. It could be interesting. But... I would not want to live that kind of a life. To me, a life on the surface is a superficial life. <laughs> and why, you know, life is hard enough. Why, why lead a superficial life go through all the hard things? If you have to go through all the hard things of life, like getting old and other things, why don't you make it worth it and make it a deep life, a life with meaning? It doesn't take that much. It's not that hard to do that. It just takes uh, a deliberate intention to do that and then regularity. So the ancient philosophers um, also associated wisdom with happiness. Um, this is a quote from Cicero, the famous 
Roman orator. And he actually uh, studied a lot of the Stoic literature, the literature philosophy of the Greeks. And uh, he has, Cicero wrote several dialogues. I have those in my library. Um, some of the critics criticize him because they said it's not original uh, thoughts, and that's true. But what he did is he brought the ancient thought of the ancient Greek philosophers to the current Romans of that day, spoke in their language. So I think that's a very valuable service he did. And he's very clear in his writings. This quote, he says, the wise, oh, another typo, the wise man is free from all those disturbances of the soul which I describe as passions. His heart is full of tranquil calm forever. How many times have we read that we have to control, learn to control the astral body, uh, learn to control the passions, these impulses, because they can lead us to making wrong decisions, uh, doing foolish things. That's always been the case in Cicero's time and even today. Finally, um, the last characteristic is self-reliance. And uh, for this quote, I am going to one of the Roman philosophers, a Stoic philosopher known as Seneca, the first century AD. There is about wisdom a nobility and magnificence in the fact that she, notice he, she, he, he uses a feminine gender for wisdom in the fact that she doesn't just fall to a person's lot, uh, another typo, that each man owes her to his own efforts, that one doesn't go to anyone other than oneself to find her. As I said, you can't buy it, you can't purchase it, somebody can't hand it to you. Um, you have to find it for yourself. You, I mean, you can have guidance. There are many teachers, many things that can help you and assist you in that search. But ultimately, each one of us has to come to that realization of wisdom by our own efforts with help of others, but we have to do the heavy lifting. It won't just fall into our laps like manas from heaven. It would be great if it did. That would be so wonderful, but it's just the way, it, it's not the way it is. So let's have a little uh, brief recap here. What the points we covered, just to recapitulate. Uh, knowledge comes from, oh, you know, I'm gonna go back and correct all these typos. I did this kind of quickly. Anyway, knowledge comes from without, wisdom from within. Time is required for wisdom to surface. Knowledge has a price, whereas Wisdom is priceless. While knowledge may and often does lead to pride, wisdom is always accompanied by humility, true wisdom. Knowledge may or may not change the way you and I live our lives, but wisdom will have a profound effect on our character, our actions, and that is something to really aspire towards. We have to have knowledge of various types, but let us not forget wisdom. As I said earlier, our educational system barely touches on that, if at all. But once you recognize that wisdom is something that only human beings are capable of, and that it's a terrible shame if we live our whole life and don't try to pursue that or realize it to the extent that is possible, that's, that's, that's unfortunate that happens all right to wrap this up i've got two short i've got two excerpts from t.s Eliot. that poem the rock i just had given you two lines from t.s Eliot earlier now i'm gonna put it within context okay there's just a little a few lines but it puts those two lines in context you'll see how he leads up to it let me take a drink of water All right, um, the endless cycle of idea and action, endless invention, endless experiment, brings knowledge of motion, but not 
of stillness. Knowledge of speech, but not of silence. Knowledge of words and ignorance of the word. All of our, all our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All our ignorance brings us nearer to death. But nearness to death, no nearer to God. And then he wraps it up. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we have lost in information? That um, concludes my presentation. I hope I have given you uh, some thoughts, stimulated you to think about this topic. Maybe do a little digging yourself. And at least to realize that each one of us are capable to a degree of being wise. The wisdom is really what it's all about, all this knowledge, the theosophical knowledge. That's the ultimate thing to be a wise person. Knowing things, that's great. But you know, in a fast changing world, a lot of the things that you know, unfortunately, they're going to become obsolete in 10 or 15 years, especially if it's of a technological nature, medical, things change. So, you know, the world changes, but I think wisdom is something that is timeless and it is priceless. <laughs>